Um, I'm going to ask for a couple of people to come up and help me out with a little demonstration here. Mike and Noah, could you come up front here? Yes. Most of you, if not all of you, um, have probably heard about the trust game or trust exercise. Oh, and for those that haven't, um, I'll explain it here. One person, in this case, that'll be Noah. Noah, are you familiar with this? Yeah. Okay. We'll turn around, turn and face that, that wall, and cross your arms in front of your chest. Take one step forward, okay? And when I tell you, you'll fall back, and Mike will catch you, your, your dad here. <laughs> now, Noah, let me ask you something here. Do you believe that your dad is able to catch you? Yeah. And do you believe he's willing to catch you? Yeah. Okay, all right. Then, Noah, go ahead and fall back. Pretty good, although I saw that uh -huh. foot step back there. There's just that little bit of doubt. Okay, thank you guys. Great job. There's just that little bit of doubt. You know, no matter how this went down, I was prepared for where I was going <laughs> next with this. A lot of believers are like Noah. They say that they really trust, but they still have that little bit of doubt that if they don't feel quickly enough that they're falling into God's arms, they want to put that foot back. Mm -hmm. They want to catch themselves a little bit. What does it take to do that exercise? Trust. It takes trust. It takes trust. And <clears throat> you have to mentally let go, and you have to physically just let yourself go. And those actions prove by those actions whether that trust is really there or not, right? When it comes to trust, when it comes to trusting God, we have to get to that place that we completely trust, that we're committed when we give something to God, we just let it go. We just let ourselves fall into God's arms, so to speak, and trust Him. Who do you trust? Who do you trust in life? There's so many people that we, in one way or another, have to trust. You trust your banker. If you didn't, you wouldn't go there and hand them money. You probably don't, every time you hand that teller money, think, gee, I wonder if she's really going to put that in my account or she just put it in her pocket. Mm -hmm. You trust your doctor. You trust a lot of different people. You trust the government. Oh, no, I don't trust the government. Nobody trusts the government anymore. <laughs> but you do. Whether you admit it or not, you don't feel the need to actually be prepared to fight off invaders from other countries. You don't feel the need to provide for all the different things. You trust when you turn on that faucet that water's going to come out of it, and that's a, municipal, a, a governmental municipality that is responsible for that. There's so many different things that you still trust that we don't even think about. And that's what trust really gets down to. When you trust, when you go to turn on that, when you turn on that faucet, you trust that it's going to be there. When you flip that light switch, you trust those lights are going to come on. And if it doesn't, you're surprised. You're surprised. You didn't say, well, geez, I, you know, I kind of thought it probably <laughs> wouldn't. You expected it. You just expected it. And that's what trust involves. Why do you trust who you trust? Why do you trust who you trust? Well, you can turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs 3, 
This is the verse, this is the section in Proverbs 3 that we're going to be really spending our time in. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. If we can trust others, certainly we can trust God. And we should trust God so much more than others. You don't have to read, turn there, but just a couple of verses I'll read to you. Psalm 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Trusting in chariots and horses, those represent the power of a kingdom or a government. In Psalms 118, verse 8, it says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. It's better to trust in the Lord than put confidence in princes. And if more Christians trusted more in the Lord, they'd be a lot less shook about what prince might be ruling at any given time. But if their trust in, is in the princes, well, then they've got to be shook. They, they have reason to be shook. We trust in the Lord. We trust in Him. In verse 1 of Proverbs, we begin to get an idea of why it is that we can trust in God. Why do we trust in, in doctors or teachers or lawyers? Because we've been taught that we should or can. We've been taught in life both by instruction and experience what we trust in and who we trust in. And when it comes to getting to that point of completely trusting God, it happens as we grow in our knowledge and as we grow in that experiential knowledge as well. In Proverbs 3, in verse 1, it says, My son... Forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. It says to not forget his word. To not let truth forsake you to write that truth upon the table of your heart. That you've got that word so written in your heart, so deeply within your heart, that you know what God is able and willing to do. Verse 4. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine what? Heart. heart. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And if you're going to be able to trust in the Lord with all your heart, it's going to take having that word written on the tables of your heart. It's going to have that word deep within your heart so that you can then trust God with all of your heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. There are two causes for fear. And the two causes for fear are ignorance and wrong teaching. And there are two ways to overcome it. Right teaching and instruction. And fear is the enemy of trust. Doubt, worry, fear are the opposites of confidence, trust, and believing. And it's that confidence, trust, and believing that causes us to see God's promises come to pass in our lives. So, if we want to trust more, then we need more instruction. And we need more right teaching. More instruction of who God is more instruction in his word of what he'll do. And to so build that in our hearts that we just know that we know that we know. 
We have to have the Word of God take preeminence over everything, including our own experiences, because sometimes it's our experiences that we work against. It's the things that we've experienced or we've heard other people experience that are the cause for fear, that are the cause for not completely trusting at times. But we can overcome this. We can grow in our trust in the Lord. We can grow in our confidence toward Him. I thought about with that little demonstration, giving Mike and Noah a heads up before I did it and letting them do it once or twice beforehand. And I'm sure if I had done that, after once or twice of seeing his father catch him, Noah wouldn't have put his foot back because he'd learn by experience that he could trust that Mike actually could catch him <laughs> and that he was, he was willing, no matter what Noah might have done yesterday that, <laughs> that caused him to question that. But we trust God. We trust Him. In Proverbs 4, you can turn there. We see why it's so important to trust Him with all of our heart in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep or guard is that word, your heart with all diligence, because out of it come the issues of life, the important things. And that's where believing comes from. It comes from that deep place within. Sometimes it's difficult for people to really recognize where that trust is. That they think that they're trusting, but then when they're in the situation, they may discover that that's not really the case. But that's why we have to guard that heart. We have to guard what comes into it and what we allow to, to just take root. The heart is comprised of that innermost part of the mind, that, that what you really, really, truly believe. And that's made up of what you've put in there. Some things are deep within your heart because some event, some incident, something happened that was so big, so strong, it made such an impression on you that it shaped you from that point on. You know, and that can be positive or negative. You could have some traumatic experience, and because of some traumatic experience, you're afraid to do such and such. You know, you, you somebody, Noah, maybe he was locked in the closet when he was young. <laughs> And, and that's given him trust issues. <laughs> no, that didn't happen. But, but certainly, I, I make fun. But nonetheless, in childhood, things can happen. And that makes it more difficult for people to really trust. And that's transferred to God. And so many times, people transfer those experiences or those relationships that they had, perhaps with their parents or with other people. And they transfer those feelings and that mistrust that they learn from that over to God. And that's why it takes that growing in that knowledge and experience with God. We can't necessarily guard against those kind of things from happening, but we can guard against what we feed our minds. There's so much in the world right now and just with all the the turmoil that we've gone through in the past year with pandemics and other world events and national events and all that stuff can just wear away at a person so that they start to get concerned well my goodness what's going to happen tomorrow but the starting point of keeping and guarding that heart is to not even let your mind go down that road to not entertain those thoughts, to not consider them, to not foster them. We guard our hearts with all diligence. Psalm 119, verse 11. This is similar to what we saw in Proverbs. And many of you have this scripture memorized, I'm sure. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, 
It's not hid from, you know, we're not hiding it from ourselves. It's not like, oh, it's in there somewhere, but I can't find it. It's, it's just hidden somewhere. It's hidden that it's, you know, kept in that deep place, and, and you really have it deep within your heart, and you've made the practice of doing that. That doesn't just happen. And no matter how much you, you did it at one time, it can be eroded if you don't continue to hide it in a daily basis. To combat all the negatives, we have to daily go to God's Word. We have to read it. We have to meditate on it. We have to think about God and His willingness to take care of it. And there's so many other things that we can do to have the truth built in our hearts and stay there. Having, you know the wonderful availability of the, the worship manifestations, of interpretation of tongues and prophecy, where we can continue to hear those encouraging and comforting words. All of that builds our trust. But that won't happen if we're not in a situation where we can hear those words, will it? Look at Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. It's said in Proverbs, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. And that's why we shouldn't lean unto our own understanding, because... God's ways are so much higher than ours. His wisdom is so much greater. And if we rest and trust our own understanding, then we're going to miss it. We're going to limit God. We're not going to allow God to really do what He can. Trusting in your own understanding, leaning on your own understanding, is like putting that foot back there. It's like, okay, I, I'm trusting you, but I've got to see how you're going to do this. You know what? That's only going to get in the way. God doesn't need you to figure it out for him. He does not need you to figure it out for him. You know, <clears throat> if you went to the doctor and there was something wrong with you, and you won't get a doctor to do this, but you go in there and you say, you know, doc, I've looked this up on the internet and I, I'm convinced that the problem is I, I've, I've got, you know, the, the beriberi disease. And what I need for you to do is give me some Maxawaka medicine. <laughs> now, the doctor's not going to do that, but suppose he did. What do you think the chances are of you being right when it comes to that? You wouldn't approach your health that way with a doctor because you trust that that doctor knows more than you do about how to fix what's ailing you, even if you look it up. You still trust that that doctor knows more than you. And you don't feel the obligation, the need, to try to figure it out for him of what he should do to fix you. Leaning into our own understanding, when we begin to tell God, well, God, I've got a need, and, and this is how you should take care of it. I have a need for a job. I want it to be there. It's got to be that place. Or I have a need for this, and God, you should do that. That's not trusting God with all of our heart. We're still leaning to our own understanding. Go back to Proverbs 3. While you're going there, I'll read this one to you. Proverbs 14, verse 12. There's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You know, we can try think that we know what's best for us. We can think that when it comes to our heart's desires, 
when it comes to the goals, when it comes to the things that we really want. We can think that we've got it all figured out and we know just how it happens. But you know what? There are times where there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. There's another place in Proverbs where it says every man is right in, every man's way is right in his own eyes. Everybody thinks that they've got the right way to go. Everybody thinks that what they're doing is right, but sometimes that action can be very, very wrong. And that's why we don't lean onto that own understanding because that, that, own under, that understanding that is ours, where did it come from? Where did it come from in the first place? You know, you weren't born with this set of understanding. You weren't born with all this wisdom of the world. That understanding is a result of what's been built in there, what's been put in there. And some of that may have been by choice, but a lot of it, it is based on what happened or what you were taught. And maybe you shouldn't have trusted everything that you were taught. What we can always trust is this. I might not be able to trust everything I've been taught in life, as well-meaning as teachers and other people might be, they can be wrong. They can be wrong. But God's word, that I can trust. That I can stake my very life on. In Proverbs 3, verse 6, it says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. In all your ways acknowledge him. All your ways. And think about that in all your ways and what that means. That word way, in the Bible and in the, in the, the Hebrew of that, um, it's often translated journeys. And your ways, it can incorporate just your manner of living, and it does. But it's also all those different areas that you might journey to. In every area of your life, acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. When it comes to your job, when it comes to your family, acknowledge Him. When it comes to your relationships, when it comes to your goals, your dreams, your desires, in every area of life, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. But also in all the ways, not only those journeys, those areas that you would travel in, but in all the ways that you behave, in all the ways that you act, in all the things that you do, acknowledge Him. That word acknowledge is most often translated no. Um, it comes from the Hebrew word yada. Yada, 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 right? <laughs> and that's a primitive root which means to know properly, to ascertain by seeing. And it's used in a great variety of senses. Figuratively, literally, euphemistically, and inferentially. Inferentially would mean like indirectly. Including observation, care, recognition, and causatively, instruction, designation, punishment, and more. It's actually a very, very long definition of that word because it's used in so many different ways. But what you should recognize about that word is it does mean in all your ways to know Him. In all your ways, know Him. The Septuagint for that Hebrew word yada is the Greek word oida. So if you're familiar with that word in the Greek, oida, that gives you even more of an idea of what this word communicates. Oida, there's two, more than two words that are translated no in the New Testament, but two big ones that you see in, in Ephesians are oida and gnosko. And oida is that mental perception. We get the word video from it. Um, and gnosko is that experiential knowledge. In Ephesians, you have the two prayers. 
the first one in Ephesians 1, 17 and following, where it talks about <clears throat> that he would grant you that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that ye may know, that, and then there's those three things. What is the hope of his calling, the riches, the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is, his exceed, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who are to believe. Those th three things are what the prayer is that we would know, that we would know those three things, the power, the inheritance, and the hope. In all of our ways, we're to know Him. We're to know Him. We're to have that complete understanding and recognition of Him, to see Him. When you're in a situation, see God with you. We talk about it in the terms of practicing the presence of God. That's what it is to, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. To practice His presence. Right believing, great definition of it, is recognizing that God's presence is in you and with you in every situation. When you do that, when you're aware that He's there, that you're not on your own. When you're aware that he's there to help, that he is that ever-present help in time of need, well, then you can trust in him. There's two words that are mainly used for trust in the, in the Old Testament, this one and another. Um, the other one places a special emphasis on trust and deliverance. This one has it as well, but the other one even more. It's the one that you'll find used so many times in Psalms where David talks about trusting in God in the context of him delivering him from his enemy. And that's the, the real meaning of that word, trust, it's expecting God to deliver. And that's something that we do as well, and that's part of what this one is. But this one does take it into a broader sense, that broader sense of trusting Him, acknowledging, and then in all your ways, He will direct your paths. We need that. We need God to show us the way. We need God to tell us the way to go. We need His direct input in our lives, His direct revelation. We need Him to, to give us the specifics. The revealed Word of God gives us the general promise, but it takes so often that manifestation of word of knowledge and word of wisdom and perhaps even discerning of spirits to know specifically what we're to do in a given situation. And he'll do it. He'll do it. We need that. And it begins with just that awareness that he's there. Think about the records of Jesus Christ where you see him just going to God, stooping down and doodling in the ground while they're asking what should happen to the woman taken in adultery times where he's being questioned by the scribes, all these different situations. And he was just always aware of God's presence to the point where he could say, I do nothing of myself but what the Father tells me to do. And that's what we want to get to, that kind of level of trust in God. God bless.